Hi, and welcome to our today's webinar. I'm pleased to welcome you to our today's training on remote control and automation for seamless integration of a terahertz TDS system. And today, the greatest part of our webinar will be live. Uh, my name is uh, Milan Uri. I'm the terahertz sales engineer at Menlo Systems. And with me today is Enrico Dardanis, who is the application engineer mainly related to terahertz time domain spectroscopy systems. So you can expect from this webinar uh, at least two minutes on Menlo Systems, a short spotlight on who we are and what we are doing. Of course, you will see a quick snapshot on uh, our commercial and fiber coupled terahertz time domain spectroscopy systems. But of course, the main part of today's webinar will be a live demo of a TerraSmart with a specific focus on the remote control interface highlighted to a seamless integration automation. We will show you some examples on purging, on uh, signal monitoring, but also a live demo on a thickness detection automated software. Let us start with a quick overview on Manual Systems. Um, our company has been founded as a spin-off in 2001 as a spin-off of the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics in Munich, Garching. Our core expertise is in the metrology and femtosecond fiber lasers. As you can see from this uh, slide here, our core components are frequency comms, femtosecond fiber lasers, but also terahertz time domain spectroscopy systems. We are well known for the invention of the frequency comb, which was later Nobel Prize awarded to Professor Theodor Hensch, who is also one of the co-founders of Manual Systems. Apart from the above systems, our femtosecond fiber lasers come with a patented mode blocking technology, which is called figure nine lasers, which also make the different kind of products uh, a reliable tool. At Menlo Systems, we are having about 120, now it's almost 140 employees, out of which a good third holds a PhD degree. Uh, most of them are engineers and physicians. So this slide gives you an overview on the three key components. It's the femtosecond fiber lasers, terahertz systems, and frequency comms. Now coming back to terahertz time domain spectroscopy, Menlo Systems comes up with three different systems dedicated to very different application environments, ranging from a compact uh, system called Terra Smart System. It's an all integrated system with laser and ODU inside. Also the PC is inside. So it's basically a nine inch rack, which you can even move from place to place because it only needs a power supply. In, re in, 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 in difference to Terra Smart, in the center you see Terra K15. This is our multi-purpose uh, and multi-talent tool. It's a standalone laser device. It's a more powerful laser source, which can be even synchronized to other laser sources. And it comes with uh, the capability of optical pump and terahertz probing. So this is the multi-talent, uh, so to say. All these two units uh, come with a traditional um, optomechanical delay line in regard to the latter two. The one to the right is a Terra ASOPS, which uses two lasers that are slightly offset in the repetition rate to achieve much higher scan speeds. For instance, important for terahertz imaging. Now, all those three uh, systems are being applied to different applications. As you know, you yourself are researchers in different environments, whether it's from biosensing and spectroscopy to optics or material sciences up to non-destructive testing or pharmacy. How do we actually create and detect terahertz? Let's, let us remind us in a quick overview. You need an ultra-fast laser system, an optical delay line. The ultra-fast laser system emits two fiber coupled output port. One is going to the emitter, a second to the detector. We are using fiber coupled and uh, photoconductive switches uh, working at 1560 nanometer. Let us have a look on this scheme here, how we generate terahertz wave. An incoming optical pulse hits the semiconductor material. You create electron and hole pairs by applying a certain bias voltage to the chip. You achieve um, the emission of terahertz wave. Now, of course, you can apply different uh, terahertz optics, not only polymers, where polymer lenses are also interesting because they are much easier to align in contrast to parabolic mirrors. Certain uh, uh, applications require different terahertz optics. And it's the same principle on the detection side. An incoming optical pulse from this fiber here, which is delayed in regard to the, to the emitter arm, creates electron and hole pairs again. Now here in this case, no bias voltage must be applied because simply the incoming terahertz wave acts as the accelerator of the electrons to the hole pairs. The then measured photocurrent will be detected by an AD converter and computed by the PC to get the spectroscopic information or also the time domain data. 
Now, I like to remind you that all this process works without using any lock-in uh, uh, lock amplifier, simply because the acquisition is such fast and the PCAs deliver a high signal to noise ratio. Now, again, this shows the scheme um, by applying a delay line, which can be a motorized stage. Moving back and forth, we can sample the terahertz time trace at different timestamps and calculate the Fourier transform to achieve the spectroscopic of information of the material applied. Now, what you earn from this uh, measurement is, per definition, a time-resolved signal, which can be applied to thickness measurements, for instance, but also gives a spectroscopic footprint for different materials. Like, for instance, in this slide, I'm showing you the alpha-lactose, which, in contrast to the reference signal, shows a certain footprint and spectroscopic information that are unique to alpha-lactose. Now, from all these data, you can also measure the refractive index of alpha-lactose or look at the absorption of different materials. And now we are going to switch to a live demo of the TerraSmart. Enrico is just preparing alpha-lactose on our TerraSmart, and I close my presentation and head over to uh, Enrico's demo. Sure. So thanks, Milan, for the introduction. Uh, I actually seen that in the... Uh, in the meeting, more people come a little bit later. So for the people that come a little bit later, that was a short introduction for, uh, from Milan about Mello, some facts and figures about Mello, and a general introduction to Terrets, TDS, how we do it here at Mello and the components of the system. Please to the audience, if you have any questions on the technology, on the experiments, on the systems, um, or other requests, um, I will be pleased to uh, answer them to you in the question and answers down below. Um, we are waiting for your questions. It's the GUI of the control software of the instrument. Uh, the main element of the GUI are two. I hope you can see my pointer. Uh, on the left side, it's a plot of uh, the time domain shape of the signal. Now we are scanning in single shot. Uh, with a range of around one, uh, 100 picoseconds. At this range, our speed is around 8, 10 Hertz, and here in real time we have uh, our Fourier transformation. We can pa pa uh, tune up the parameters of the spectrometer to achieve up to 50 Hertz of scanning. That means a reduction of the range uh, to some tens of picoseconds and uh, an increasing of the speed. For spectroscopy, however, we will use a longer range because then we have access to a better resolution to resolve. For example, what we are seeing here are just water lines. Uh, the optics we are using right now, it's a parabolic mirror optic, which allows us in single shot to have already a bandwidth of over four terahertz. As you can see, comparing uh, the data we see here with some spectroscopy database of the waterline. Now I will just remove this view. And the uh, interface of the software allows you the basic function. So you can save the data, you can start and stop a scan. You can set up the scan parameters live, uh, meaning that the instrument uh, will adjust the parameters of the scan while scanning in a dynamic way. So for example, now we scan much before required. We have a find pulse function, so we can just find out where the pulse is and send it automatically to a scanning window of 100 picoseconds around the pulse we can average our signal. So we are not using a locking amplifier, meaning that uh, we take the signal in single shot. So to get, uh, to get enough signal to noise ratio at high frequency to achieve the best bandwidth, we will just average the waveform together. So here I can put a number called number of averages and my noise will go down here. So let me just remove that. And I will achieve more bandwidth, less noise, so more bandwidth in the end. I can always reset my average if I'm not satisfied. I can hold a reference signal, for example, my value at single shot, I can hold it in the background. If I put my hand in the beam and I screen the beam, then I see as a reference my signal. I can average on top of it to see the difference between single shot and average data. So what I was saying, we achieve more dynamic range. So less noise here, we can see more bandwidth. So now for 
all our tests, I will work in single shot actually to be as fast as possible. And the first small experiment I want to show you before, maybe actually we show you first components of the system. So what we are seeing now, it's maybe you can see my hands. That's mm -hmm. the Teret's optics. So the Teret's optics is in the newest upgrade of the system and the newest, newest version of the system. It's a parabolic mirror based optics with cage system to allow a very stable alignment of the components. And here we start with the antenna. So there is a detector and a meter antenna and the first mirror the first parabolic mirror collimates the beam. So in these two sections, we have collimated beam. Now uh, the two mirrors present here, they are focusing the beam at the position of the PNO, which we can use for alignment. The focal distance is standard uh, 10 centimeters in total, so five centimeters and five centimeters. That can be customized, so we can change the mirrors here for other focal length. and this can be achieved by shifting here, these two blocks through this stage. So it's standard configuration, 10 centimeters distances here, but that can be customized. On the back, you see our amplifier for signal uh, detection. And that's everything, all you need for your Teretz experiment. So it's very compact. You can think about purging it very easily, for example, with a box or with a bag or with your custom purge bots. So that's the Teretz experiment. And now if we can move the camera to the actual system. So here you see the Terra Smart logo, that's are some fans for ventilations. Here is the panel of the signal input and output. So there are two fiber outputs from the laser, which is inside the box. The first output is for the emitter, the second for the detector. There are auxiliary ports, so the system can be customized, for example, to dual channel, which is something that we do very often, for example, for people that want a reflection and transmission setup, or many or multiple detection setup in which one emitter and two detectors are present. That's everything we can do with these uh, additional ports that can be customized. We have here just uh, control commands and here we are uh, electrical signals or bias for the emitter, uh, power supply of the amplifier and signal input. That's, uh, that's used here, this input to elaborate the signal inside the box. So inside the box, we don't have only the laser. We don't have only the relay line. We have also have the electronics that it's necessary to elaborate the signal and send it to our software, which is installed in a computer, which is also inside the rack. So in this rack, you have practically everything you need to start your experiment, except from the optics. So you just attach a monitor, you just attach, for example, a wireless keyboard, like I'm using here. You attach your uh, Teretz optics and you're ready to go. The Teretz optics you can uh, attach can be this parabolic unit, can be a reflection head, like the one I'm showing you here, and I will talk about that later more. So it's a very uh, flexible system that can be integrated in many experiments. And that's why the focus of today is also integration and remote control. So you are seeing that I'm replacing the lactose probe. And now on the screen sharing, you can see the typical absorption peaks of lactose, real time, acquired with the high speed. And in compare, if you compare with the air spectrum, it's very easy to identify where they are. We see a first line at below one terahertz, a second line between one and two, either a third line here, it's even visible. If we would save these two spectra and then analyze them, we would reproduce the spectra that we saw in the slides. So, these small experiments for now close the first demo of the system in which my purpose was to show you how the system works and how fast and easy it is to make a very simple spectroscopy experiment. And now we can go on with our presentation in which we will focus more on the core of the talk. So remote control in the system to integrate it in a more complex experiment or system. Good. Thank you, Enrico. I'd like to... Um 
we cover the main important features for the specific system that you have seen here. As they all integrated system, as you know, it comes with our most compact femtosecond fiber laser called ELMO. Everything is fiber coupled inside. It is a uh, turnkey system, so to say, which is also being delivered to other companies, for instance, for near, near field uh, spectroscopy. And using these cage parabolic uh, mirrors, I guess it eases the alignment a lot. You see the performance over here. So our definition is around 95 to 100 dB peak dynamic range, not SNR, but dynamic range. The terahertz uh, bandwidth until we see water absorption lines is 6 to 6.2 or 6.5 terahertz. A scan window is defined by the um, optical delay line, which is in our case 850 picoseconds, which corresponds to less than 1.2 gigahertz of spectral resolution. Other optical delay units with even higher spectroscopic resolution or larger scan range, we are talking about Terra K15, which is a multi-talent, which can be customized in every part. Now we are coming to the questions in the chat room. Enrico, um, yeah. not sure if you have seen it already, but uh, there was one question. Maybe you can read it and also answer it in the yes, meantime. So I will try to read it. One question from Christoph. I noticed the pre-amplifier is far from the antenna, or in other words, the detector. Am yeah. I right? Usually I prefer to have it as close as possible to the antenna. So uh, actually uh, the amplifier is connected to the antenna with only a 30 centimeter SMP cable right now. But I agree with you as short as possible. Now it's just for the purpose of the demo since we will have to do with uh, a couple of optics, we decided to make it uh, with a longer cable because it allows our more flexibility actually. But it's a good comment. It's a good point. Uh, our standard is just this very short 30 centimeter cable, which just allow to go down from the optics to the amplifier and the amplifier is just there. Okay, Christoph just uh, indicated that this answers his question. So feel free to move on with the presentation on the remote interface. Now let's go to the core of the talk today. That is remote control as a key for the integration of your Teretz experiment in your existing hardware or uh, system. So what you can see, maybe Milan, you can point something on the, on the slide. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. So what you can see on the top right is uh, a robotic arm is symbolizing your existing system hardware or experiment down in the middle of the uh, PowerPoint slide, uh, you have your existing system software or experiment software. And the big issue is now if we put a new component, which can be, for example, top, le top left, the Terra Smart or the Terra K15 or the Terra Azops, uh, how to integrate this system in your whole experiment and hardware, and especially how to make the software talk together. And so if we move to the next slide, uh, this is the connection we are talking about today. What we provide uh, for free together with the software of the spectrometer is a very modern uh, remote application programming interface for the software scan control. Since scan control is the software for us for every terahertz spe uh, spectrometer, including ASOPS, uh, this interface is universal. So no matter which product of us will you acquire, can be uh, audio uh, optical delay line based system, can be a, uh, a synchronous optical sampling based system, you will have the same software and you will have the same interface. Uh, the interface is based on a peer to peer communication technology. Uh, you can work with that locally. So for example, I was telling you that the TerraSmart is an integrated computer. So you could work on that computer with your client software or you can work like we do today on my laptop over the uh, ethernet connection. Uh, the data between the server that is in our case, the software scan control and the client that is the application you will write with this protocol, it's automatically transferred. So you don't need to bother about querying all the time scan control for giving you data. If data are available, they will come over and then you can decide if you use them or not. Uh, the 
the same goes for the variables. So there are some variables indicating the status of the system, the scan range, the scan start and stop, uh, the number of averages and so on. These are all variables that are also automatically transferred to the client. So you don't need to ask all the time, what is the status? You will receive this info and you can decide if use it or not. The support for these interfaces for many, many languages, uh, including but not limited to C star, C++, Python, LabVIEW and MATLAB, specifically for C++, for C star, Python, LabVIEW and MATLAB, we have examples. Actually for MATLAB, we don't have examples, but we have the same DLLs that we can use for LabVIEW, you can use for MATLAB as well. And we have a very nice uh, user uh, guide with the source code of the examples and with the source files of them. So you, can, you don't start from scratch, you will have a starting uh, exam, a set of examples to work on and to expand. Uh, so, as I said, every function and setting and property that you can have access to the, in the graphical interface of scan control is accessible in the remote API. API. So, when you program with the API, uh, there is only one thing you have to program is your experiment, your procedure, uh, the commands that you want to send to the spectrometer, the settings you want the spectrometer to have, and the actions that you want to execute when you receive this automatic stream of data. You can ignore the stream, you can do something. This is something you have to program. So symbolized on the bottom right is this arrow. You have to just program the interaction between uh, scan control and your system software. What you don't have to program is the communication with the hardware, of course, because that's provided with scan control. So you never will have to do with uh, low level commands like move the stage here or move the stage there. You just bother about connecting with the graphical interface of scan control. So everything is included in that. You don't have to worry about it. So hardware, it's something that is already solved, so to say. So if we move to the next slide, now I will uh, want to make that a little more con bit more concrete. So I will show you a hello world. I call it example for the interface. It's just a small code to start a scan. This is part of the example library of scan control. Uh, of the remote interface that we provide in this documentation. And as I said, we provide it in C star, Python, and LabVIEW. The, the source code look all very similar. So we define the connection to uh, scan control that is visualized as an object. And then we uh, just uh, call the command start, which will be one-to-one -to, -one to be in the graphical interface. Connecting is just starting over the software and pressing start is pressing start. So C star in Python is practically the same structure. And in LabVIEW, every command line is replaced with a graphical block diagram, but in the end is the same flow. So now that's just how it looks like. Uh, today we will see something a little bit more elaborated with always a general flow how to get something out of the spectrometer, you connect, you do something and I say you enjoy. So you get the results you program. It can be an incoming pulse. So like a reproduction of the graphical interface of scan control. So you just uh, plot uh, your signal. It can be uh, just uh, something more elaborated that will be uh, doing some data analysis live. So for example, a very simple data analysis that you can make live while scanning could be extract a peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of your pulses. For example, for, as a monitoring of the stability of the system, as a monitoring of the alignment, and you can just plot them live, for example, if you are aligning um, a little bit, uh, another degree of complication would be I don't use the raw data, so the electric field data, the time domain data. I use the Fourier transform data. So I connect, I start a scan, I extract from the Fourier transformation of the data that are coming in real time, a specific waterline. I just plot the depth of the waterline, 
in this example, to be honest, I didn't calibrate the measurement. So I just plot the depth of this water line as an indicator of the purging level of my system. So we show you a little bit. We have a purging gas that is not really spectroscopic degree, but uh, it's good enough for a live demo. So we will see what happens to the water line depth live when we put on the purging. You should be able to see a source of source code in which I load my scan control and I connect and then I, here I stop actually, but I want to start a scan. So I can just modify it live. I modify it to start. Then I just press, I just run the example. And now the spectrometer should start the scanning. So now you are seeing on the camera view that the Terra Smart, maybe we can pin the camera view of me again, uh, that the Terra Smart is scanning. Now I will modify my code and I will just write stop. And what you should see now is that I should stop the scan. So the scan now is stop. And if I want to start it again, I just remodify the script. That's really the hello world example. So as you see now the scan is starting. So this example was now very simple. Let's have a look to a more elaborated example uh, with a little bit of graphical interface. So the easiest one I have for you today is just a plotting example where I plot the pulse in real time. I don't know if you can see this very small window here. Yeah, you are seeing now the, the pulse in real time. And if I stop the scan, I also put two uh, start and stop buttons. They are reproducing one to one the start and stop button on the system. So if you see now on the camera view of the system, we should be still there. Now the GUI is frozen. And if I press start, then I see there are the parts moving and here I also see that it's updating. That's now a ground zero example. There is not even a time scale here. I just put the number of points and here there is no unit. So it's very, uh, very fast program example. We can make it more complicated. And so let's move to the more interesting examples now. So now you should see a plot that is called peak to peak value. Uh, now it's uh, just steady, uh, static. If I press start, what you will see in the plot will not be anymore a plot of the uh, signal or the Fourier transform, but it's already a online data analysis elaboration. So very simple one. I'm just plotting the peak to peak value of the signal. So now this, you see the pulse number going on. And here is the value of the peak to peak. Now we have 10 volts, so 10 arbitrary units. And maybe my colleague can now try, for example, to screen the signal. So it will focus on the optics to let you see, to let you see what he's doing. And now it will go there and for example, just put a screen. So to the audience, you can actually move the bar. There's a vertical bar by which you can decide which screen is the large one. Yeah, so for example, you can make the, my window now a little bit smaller. Now what we are seeing, we are seeing is just we are screening the signal. So when we put the metal plate through the beam, of course, our peak to peak goes to zero. And that can be the speed of this. Uh, it's just depending on the scanning speed. So if I put the system to 50 Hertz, in principle, if my graphical interface is fast enough, we can see it at 50 Hertz. It's usually not necessary. That's why we have a function in the remote control interface that reduces the speed of display, but the data you can always scale it at the speed of acquisition. So for this show uh, here, the speed is limited to 20 Hertz, but uh, everything faster is possible for saving the data. I can stop that at any moment. It will just end here and I can start it over again. It will start over again. So when I press start, it will start the scanning of the spectrometer. And as soon as the pulse data are coming, it will plot them automatically. It is not asking all the time, give me a pulse. 
is just waiting that the spectrometer gives a path. So for example, if now here I don't do anything, start and stop, but uh, my colleague goes there and just stop the graphical interface of scan control from his own computer station, just go there and stop it. You will see here on the graph that is stopped. If it starts over again, my program is still waiting for data. It will continue plotting again as soon as the data are available again. So this is what I meant when I was talking about a dynamic way of communicating. We are not asking all the time the system give me the data because in this case, if the system would stop to scan, then we would have a error, right? Like this, uh, it's everything relaxed, so to say. The client is there and waits for the data. If the data comes, they are used. If they don't come, no action is triggered. There's one question in the chat room. Uh, I'd like to read it. Maybe you can answer to that. Yes, please. It is in regard of so-called example three, which you showed. And question comes from Simon Christman or Simon Christman. Does the collection of measurement data in the example three work event-based or do you have to pull for new measurements? It's event-based. Uh, we do have also, uh, a version which is polling, but that's the old interfaces. We don't support that anymore. We are now on event-based basis. Thank you, Enrico. Simon, I hope this answers your question. If so, then please indicate it in the chat room. And to all the other participants, I'd like to encourage your questions. There's one more just incoming, Enrico, from Christoph again. Uh, is the Ethernet the only interface that you can use? Well, uh, if you work locally, uh, it's just, uh, it's called internet, but it's the local host. But yes, it's, uh, you can use also web browser. Uh, I mean, ethernet is only to have an IP address, so to say. So yes, probably we can say that it's a, you need a web protocol. It's a web protocol, so. In the meantime, uh, I'd also like to invite you to participate in our survey. There's a small survey on this webinar today. I hope the host will be able to open it to all the participants. Uh, now it just popped up. So if you have a couple of seconds, it's just one button to press. Please give us a signal if you like the webinar, how it is, or you don't like it, or maybe you're neutral. Thanks. We are happy of every feedback, even if it's negative, because from there we can learn. One more question in the meantime from yes. Simon Christman again. He's thanking you for the answer and I, he has one more question. Yes. Um, I just read it. You say something about a DDL, DLL file. Can yeah. you use the API on non-Windows based platforms as well? So on non-Windows based platform as well. Uh, I believe so because for example, if you think about using Python on Linux, that's no problem, right? So, uh, to be honest, my experience in the companies has been everything with Windows just because we have Windows everywhere, but I would not exclude that it's possible. What kind of uh, programming environment are you thinking about? I mean, the protocol is very universal. So actually every language capable of uh, internet communication, it's- Christoph, if you, no, Simon, if you want to speak, uh, you can unmute your microphone, I guess, if the, host allows to do so. Otherwise, you can, of course, always use the uh, chat window to give us more hints. Also, yeah, uh, I, please indicate if the question is answered. Oh, okay, here you are. Uh, I hope I hope my micro microphone is working. Uh, mm -hmm. It was basically a reference to run Python on Linux because, uh, yeah, Python is like very universal regarding operating systems. Uh, however, if your API is, would be backed by a DLL file, it's... Uh... Ah, no, 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 um, that's a good point. Uh, the DLLs are more for the uh, other languages like LabVIEW and... Oh, yeah, okay. So yeah, that cool. is kind of compiled uh, where you load uh, the DLLs that you need more for MATLAB and LabVIEW. For Python and CSTAR, it's more, uh, it's, a, it's this, uh, you just pull, you just uh, don't need the DLLs. So that's not an issue. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, uh, I think we are very, uh, we are ready. Enrico, before we start a quick question from Christoph again, um, yeah. I'm not sure if you answered this already because I had to fight my microphone, but, uh, he's asking 
If that means that Python library communicates directly, sending low-level commands via Ethernet? So, uh, um, as I said he before... Asked, one second. Uh, he's yeah. asking to be sure. Yeah. Um, do you provide documentation of low-level documentation of Ethernet commands? Okay, so for Python, we provide a client file where every function is already defined. So, you will not need to bother you with low-level stuff. So, for example, this dot .start function is already there. So you will not get only the source code of the examples, but also a scan control.py library file, which is what for MATLAB will be the DLL. So it's a .py file where all the functions are defined. So you can use them right away. Christoph, I hope this answers your question. Yeah, fine. It says, it says so I think that was the answer. Yeah, it looks like it's humid. Okay, so now it's humid, and now we can just purge it. And the purging degree should increase. Yeah, it increased, but the flux was so heavy that the target went away. <laughs> so what you are seeing in this plot is the purging is increasing, and then unfortunately the target falls down. So now we have a normal purging degree, maybe a little bit more purged than usual. We will start the purging gas. And you see an increase in the purging degree. So now with the plot starts over here, we were at 50 and the purging degree is increasing and increasing slowly. Now the purging gas, as I was saying, is not uh, spectroscopy level. So the difference will not be so hard, but you are seeing here that the water line are reducing. So I think that was all to be honest about this. Uh, as I said, it's only a qualitative measurement, but it can tell you how powerful is the interface because I can plot a lot of things. I can plot my spectra, I can plot my purging degree. I can imagine every kind of uh, data elaboration at the real time that I could just program in a matter of a few lines of codes because the difference between this example and the first very example is only really a few lines of code. Enrico, I think we move over to two yes. application examples before we show the thickness detection measurement yes. on the car that you see in the back, the BMW. But I'd like to share the screen for you and you can continue with the two application examples. Okay, so um, how, do you, how can you use all this interface? For example, we have recently in our uh, application notes uh, manipulating uh, light with metamaterials. The experiment can be complicated when you work with metamaterials because you have to move many parameters in your experiment while acquiring your terrace data. So for example, here in the right plot, uh, you, you move, you sweep, for example, a bias or you may rotate a polarizer. So what about automating it? So you connect uh, to your spectrometer, you sweep and rotate the bias with your own hardware and software, but you integrate in your hardware software, the spectrometer via the remote interface, and then you enjoy the result of your experiment sitting somewhere else and not having to do it manually. And the same uh, can be applied, of course, to non-destructive testing. So now imagine you want uh, to image plastic or next slide, you want uh, to measure thicknesses. Uh, of course, you can just take your data manually and then analyze the data in a separate script, but you can also do it real time like we're doing now. And that's a very nice application of our reflection head and a ready program that we uh, write based on the interface, which uh, uh, just do this thickness analysis in the real time. So now I will move to the last demo part. So I will change my position to the other, to the system. And I will show you this nice software that we program with a much better uh, uh, aspect. So we take care really that it looks nice and works nicely. So let me you just... tell me when you are ready. So now in the background of that scan control is uh, running. And now the software is telling me, please insert a reference and press the set reference button. So if you are looking at the camera view, which should be still active, you are seeing me with the target. And I yes. will put the target on the reflection head, press it against, and then I press the button set reference. The software detecting only one peak which is okay because we have a reflection target with non-layers. So 
in the thickness detection algorithm, we have not equals. So we have only one reflection from the metal surface. This is used as a reference now to measure thicknesses. So for example, uh, let's take the BMW. 10 minutes, Enrico. Let's take the BMW car. A very nice application uh, of thickness measurement is I go through a paint layer. Uh, the last layer of, of all the structure is the metal structure of the model that makes the main reflection. But if I have many layer paint, paint, painting layers, I will have also intermediate reflection between the layers. This intermediate reflection will have some separation and the timing of this separation, if it's calibrated with the correct refractive index, that's the reason why we have two kinds of materials, plastic and metal paint, we have different calibration settings. If it's calibrated, this timing can tell me the thickness. So now I will just use it to measure. And for example, here we are measuring 70 micron, that's real time. Uh, I can measure it somewhere else. Here it's a little bit thicker, it's 80 micron. The same can be done, of course, with polymers, but I need to calibrate uh, my uh, algorithm with other refractive indices. So now the thickness I will extract uh, may depend on the actual weight of the refractive index, but that's now a uh, canteen card. I will just put it on the reflection head. When I put my finger there, it detects only one peak, that's bad. So now here, there is some issues of alignment. Yeah, so I measure him allow about one millimeter. It's probably a 100 micron less, but that's if you measure it with a caliper, but that depends on the exact calibration of the refractive index. So uh, that actually conclude this part. So I think we'll come back to my uh, position and uh, we come to the conclusion of the talk. I will take over from here. Thank you, Enrico. Sure. So we have seen the live demo from Enrico in regard to the thickness measurements. Uh, I come to the conclusion, not without giving you a quick wrap-up wrap up of what you have seen. You have seen state-of-the-art fiber coupled terahertz systems, at least one live of them. Uh, we have shown you the TerraSmart system. And in, in specific, we have shown you the capabilities of the API in regard to three example measurements on, for instance, signal monitoring, humidity sensing, but also layer thickness measurements. I do not like to close before inviting you to our talk on Friday on terahertz spectroscopy at 30 kilohertz rate. And this is held by Dr. Ole Peters, who is the terahertz group manager at Menlo System and will be on Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern Central uh, Eastern EST in the spectroscopy session. With that, we'd like to close the talk. I don't see any more questions in the questions and answer part. So thanks all participants for tuning in today.